Hi everyone, my name is Julia Doherty from Adventure Geek and this is a show all about the Camino. Now it's great reading books and online forums but it's better to hear the real stories from true experiences from real life pilgrims and that's what we're going to be experiencing today. Now if you have no idea what the Camino is about then let me explain. It's a trek across northern Spain. Normally it takes like five to six weeks to go from one part of um, Spain to the other. Um, and it's been around for a thousand of years and pilgrims walk to Santiago de Compostela where the remains of St. James, which is Jesus' apostle, is said to have been buried. Originally this, is, uh, this journey was a religious adventure um, and to this day it still is for many people. I don't know if it was for you Norman, we'll soon find out. Um, but you know, there are lots and lots of different reasons as to why people walk the Camino. Just through um, you know, complete transparency, just to let you guys know that this is a pre-recorded show. Um, but we're both here to answer any of your questions. So if you've got any questions, just leave them in the comments below uh, and we'll respond to them. So without further ado, let me crack on and I'm going to introduce today's guest. Hello, Pilgrim. Hello. <laughs> this is Norman, Norman Stevens, who's a teacher from sunny California. Uh, he spent time walking the Camino in 2018, so he was with us on our last stretch. In fact, I think I walked with you the day before uh, the day I got into Santiago. I remember that walk very, very well. So Norman's quite organised with your gear, if I remember rightly. All your, all your pack was all quite well organised and you, you knew all about weights and stuff like that. And I reckon that was probably because um, you'd done a little bit of the PCT and I know you're going to be doing a little bit of the AT next year, is that right? That is correct, yes. Okay, so for people who don't know, what is the PCT? The PCT is the Pacific Crest Trail that runs from Mexico to Canada along, well, following the crest of the mountains. So it's a bit like that. It's a bit of up and down. There's some desert walking as well but it mainly tries to follow the natural elevation of the mountains. Not actually cresting the peak of every mountain, of course, but just following the general path of the mountains. Absolutely. So, um, if you've ever watched the film Wild, have you seen that? I have seen that. In fact, I was one of only two people, I think, on the PCT that liked the movie Wild. <laughs> I have an intense hatred. Uh, because they felt it was not about the PCT, and I would say that's true. It's not that's about true. The that's not that's not what it was about. But if anything, it's a bit like the film The Way, isn't it, for the Camino? It it, it just and you know, wild in the woods or no, walk in the woods for the AT Appalachian Trail. Certainly, yeah. It, well, I was just going to add, wild is about a woman recovering from her mother's death, which is really the point of the movie. So yeah, um, in the woods, good movie. Uh, again, there's people on the AT that hate that movie uh, because he claimed that he was a through hiker when in fact he only hiked a portion of the AT. Uh, Just a section. Movie after a while. <laughs> so, right, I'm going to take you right back now. So, when did you actually first hear about the Camino? Can you remember that day or how it happened? I do. I do, I do remember that day. It was a cold, wintry day. I, it was actually a podcast. Similar to this, it was Rick Steves' um, travel podcast. Rick Steves okay. organized trips, mainly to Europe. And people called in, and a woman called in about the Camino, and it sounded intriguing. And that was about 10 years ago. And then, of course, the movie The Way came out, and that was the, the movie that really put the hook in me. So the, the movie The Way made me say, yes, that's it, I want to go. So, I mean, did you feel called to do the Camino? You'd obviously heard about it a few times, and it's obviously kept nagging somewhere at the back of your mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I did. Um, I had to cancel my first planned trip. I had taken time off from work, and I had to cancel that. Uh, my father got ill, so I decided to stay home and take care, and he got better. Okay. Um, so I decided instead to use the summer vacation. I'm a teacher, and it all worked out perfectly. But, yes, there's certainly a calling. People hear about the Camino, they get inspired, or at least intrigued, and I did. So I'm very glad I did it. I'm very glad I met you. Hey, hey, hey. vice versa. <laughs> I'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> so have you got family at home? Like a I wife have, and kids? Or? I have a, my wife who lives here in sunny Inyo Kern, California, uh, which is in the Mojave Desert, uh -huh. and I have my up near San Francisco, a town called Mill Valley, and my sister lives in that town as well. 
Okay, so how did your wife feel about you disappearing for, you know, five, six weeks? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, she was sad, but she was also quite supportive. So I was gone for seven weeks from oh, door to door. Seven weeks? Seven weeks, yeah. Um, I'm also a very lazy walker as well. So there's that. A lazy <laughs> walker? What's a lazy like, walker? Well, I didn't have a set agenda every day. I had unlimited time, so I took my time. Also, I wanted to have time at either end to kind of adjust, so I spent, oh, one or a couple of days in Paris at the very end. Um, and then there's time to get to the trail, and I walked on from Santiago to uh, Muxia, and uh, that took a few more days, and then uh, back to Santiago, and then flew. So there's all the time in between. The actual walking on the Camino was about five and a half weeks or six weeks, somewhere around there. Okay, so just for clarification then, you did the French way, is that right? Correct, I did the French way, yes. And where did you actually start? I started in saint jean pied uh, okay. France. Uh, <laughs> and so. just, just curious, did you do saint jean to Roncesvalles or did you stop at the Orison? I stopped at Orison, which I heartily recommend to anybody and everybody Ori Sun is not very far from Saint Jean. It was about eight kilometers, roughly, or ten, I forget. But it took about two to three hours to get there from Saint Jean. It's because it's like that, isn't it? It's like yeah. crazy uh, steep. That steep. Uh, I say that because I got there in the afternoon, and by two o'clock, a huge storm had blown in, and it was a complete whiteout outside. And uh, pilgrims were coming in to the hostel and begging for a place to stay. And the owner, sadly, had to turn them away because every place requires a reservation. That is, every person coming to that hostel must have a reservation. I don't think that's cruelty. He just has a limited number of beds. Yeah. Um, so I recommend it because the first day, many people have said, can be the hardest trying to get from Saint-Jean over the Pyrenees and down into Ronson, Ronson's Valles. So I thought, why do that to myself? And um, it's a good idea. So I recommend it. It's not a race. <laughs> and did you enjoy the? Did you have the pilgrim meal at the Orison? I did. I typically had the pilgrim meal whenever I stayed at a at a refugio or an alberge, and it was pretty good. Um, yeah. By the way, anybody contemplating the Camino, be sure that you like bread. Yes, <laughs> bread and sausage. Bread, yeah. Mainly bread, I found. Bread, yeah. I yeah. must admit, it's everything's bread. Breakfast is, you know, French loaf cut in half. French yeah. loaf cut in half, and after a day of walking, it's pretty tasty. Uh, one time a lady gave me a sandwich that was bread with a little bit of tuna inside, and I thought, I'm never going to eat this. I'm tired of bread. I ate the whole thing at the end of the day. It was delicious. <laughs> So when you're, at the, when you're at the Orison, they do you lunch for the next day. Um, me, well, I, that's what we had, like Bocadillas, what, like, right. which is bread. Well, you did it at Orison as well. You were Sorry? at Orison as well. I, I've stayed there twice, yeah. Oh, twice, okay. Well, I can interview you now. Do you recommend <laughs> it? I definitely would recommend it, yeah. Okay. So, okay. And order the, order, the, order the lunch for the next day. Uh, yes. Otherwise, there's nowhere to sort of resupply. Um, Good point. That's a great point. That's true. Yeah. Um, some days there's a gentleman up near the summit of the Pyrenees that has a little coffee stand with some sandwiches, but I wouldn't rely on that. Uh, he was yeah. there, when he was, but I don't think that's a good way to uh, plan for going over the Pyrenees. Well, I, so I did I, it once in May and once in October, and that guy was there in the May one, but he wasn't there in October. Well, Okay. And I was relying on it as well, you know. Well, not relying on it, but it was like you know it was going to be there. And then I was dis so disappointed when it wasn't. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So talking of the bad weather over the Pyrenees, what sort of rain kit did you have? Did you have a poncho or did you have a rain jacket? I had jacket? a rain jacket. Yes, I had a rain jacket. I also had a um, down pullover anorak you know, puffy jacket for warmth. And I also had rain pants. And okay. I used every item of clothing that I brought throughout the Camino. Okay. So you didn't do the poncho thing? No. No, I had bad luck with the poncho earlier. The wind just kind of kicked it up and blew it around, so I didn't care for poncho. I tend to sweat more in the poncho, I discovered. So whatever system works for a person. Okay. 
So, um, so talking about the Camino then, as we were saying, some people walk for religious reasons, spiritual reasons. When I was um, sitting there listening to the stories going around the table at that first night at the Orison, um, people come out with, it's amazing how much people share just on that first night, and it's quite quite shocking really. Some people just walk for you know, a challenge, a um, physical challenge. So uh, you you don't have to if you don't feel comfortable sharing your reasons for walking then that's fine we can move on but if you are comfortable then then please no, share. No, I'm a very boring person so you can <laughs> ask anything. Let's see the reasons why I walked were pretty much everything you just mentioned. I wanted the religious reasons. I wanted a spiritual journey. Um, really, the history and the culture sounded fascinating. Um, the food sounded pretty good. Uh, going through the wine regions actually sounded intriguing. Uh, it all sounded wonderful. And really, the uh, companionship, the people walking the Camino sounded quite nice. Because in the U.S., the wilderness trails, that is the PCT and the AT, are fairly empty. Uh, the Appalachian Trail, maybe not as much. But the Camino just sounded like a community of people. So that sounded intriguing. And um, I'm not a religious person by nature. But I wound up going to church services about five or six times. Enjoyed them. It was very peaceful yeah. and a chance to meditate. Is, is there any sort of buildings or, or anything that sort of sticks in your mind that you think, wow, everyone, people should go and see that? Yeah, I quite like the church in Astorga. Um, okay. There was nobody there when I walked in. It was cool and comfortable. Um, the columns inside the church are amazing. And a family came in after I'd been there for about 10 minutes, and the children were very well behaved. But I found the church beautiful and light and airy. And then uh, you have me thinking now about church services. I recommend, strongly recommend, everyone attend the pilgrim service in Ronson's Valles, uh, which I found quite beautiful and historical. Right? Yeah. I think the, um, the when, when we talk about churches, there was one particular um, episode that happened with me in Los Arcos. Do you remember Los Arcos? I, so I, I get in, I, I was there really early. I think I'd arrived about 12 o'clock or something like that. Um, and a lot of my Camino family were walking on, but I was really tired. So I said, well, I'm stopping the night and I'll catch you up the next day or whatever. This is when I was walking on my own. So I wasn't with mm -hmm. Rachel or, or anyone. And I thought, oh, well, as I'm early, I'll, I'll go into the church. So I went into the church, and I sat there. I don't know how long I was there. I think I must have been there a good hour or so. Uh, anyway, I felt I was there. There was nobody else in the church. I was there on my own. And then I felt this tap on my shoulder. And the priest went around. It was the priest. And he says in, in his Spanish accent, I'm not going to do a Spanish accent. But he said to me, uh, how, how did you get in the church? And he was, like, looking at me all querying and I says, well, you know, I, I walked through the door. <laughs> How else would I get in the church? And he says, no, you didn't. And he was quite accusing. And uh, I says, well, that's exactly how I got in. He says, it's been locked since 10 o'clock this morning. And he had to let me out. So I have no idea what happened there. But then he took me to the door. And there must have been about 10 locks to let me out the door, which is mm -hmm. really weird. So I don't, I don't know what happened there. And I don't know how long I was there. I th I'm sure I was there at least an hour. Just sitting mm -hmm. there, not really knowing where time's going. But that was really strange. Did you could do have the... Senior moment for the priest, I suppose. He could have been uh, counting wafers in the back room and simply forgot that he left the door unlocked. Who knows? Yeah, I, I don't remember walking in, which is the weird thing as well, but... I don't, I don't, I don't know. Anyway, um, so uh, did you do the pilgrim mass in, in Santiago? I did actually. I did it twice. I oh, did uh, you? Because, because when I got there, and actually seeing you in the plaza was one of the happiest moments of my life. But <laughs> uh, I went there uh, after I took a shower, which I recommend as well for your fellow uh, parishioners. But um, I went there the first time. I believe it was yeah weekday. Very excited because I couldn't wait to see the Bota Fumero fly by. That is that incense covered device. And that sounded historical and uplifting. And um, as the service continued and we started winding down the service, I looked around and people realized we were not going to see the Bota Fumero. 
and I've never seen so many angry pilgrims in one room. Yeah. Boy, were they disappointed. And it doesn't swing every day. There's no announcement of when it will swing. So I chalked it up just to one of life's mysteries. And the next day I continued on um, and to Mushia and the coast to the Atlantic and then realized, wait a minute, if I come back now on a Sunday, I bet on a Sunday I'm going to see that Bota Fumetto swing. So I got back on a Sunday, had time to check in, shower, change my clothes, ran to the church, uh, it was packed, but found a place to stand, and the boat of Fumero swung, and it was beautiful. It was great. So, if at first you Go don't see, see, keep hanging out around that church, and you will see the boat of Fumero. <laughs> Fantastic! Did you go to Finisterre as well, or just to? I Michigan? did. Yeah, uh, it was there in Finisterre that I ran into what's the guy from Ireland? What's Dara. The, Dara, who I saw yeah. where I saw. And I also saw Lara in Finisterre and had a delightful lunch. And Lara, uh, side note, Lara's a lovely Canadian woman that I met the third night on the Camino and saw sporadically. And then, poof, she kind of vanished. Uh, and I didn't see her for about four weeks, three and a half weeks. And walking back from the Cape, who do I bump into but Lara? It was wonderful. We had lunch together the next day and caught up. <laughs> we did the same because me and Rachel took, we had a road trip, so we hired a car from Santiago because we only had like a couple of days uh, and we went to Fistera. We left Julie in Santiago. Uh, and then when we got there, um, we then caught up with, do you remember Anita and Denise from California? Yes. Both teachers as well. Right, we, we had dinner with them. It was a fantastic in Santiago. Yes, it was fun chatting with them. Yeah. That was probably the best meal I think we had because that was just so memorable. It's like we all called it the Last Supper. Um, <laughs> and there was 12 of us around the table as well, wasn't there? Oh, I didn't think of that. That's wonderful. Uh, it was great because <laughs> I was ordering different dishes that I hadn't eaten. So I thought this is a culmination. Finally, I'm eating Spanish cuisine, not just bread. This is great. And, <laughs> bread and, and chips. You organize it. Thank you so much. That was fun. I don't think it was me. I think I don't know who it was that chose. I just went along with the crowd. But uh, probably Sue who did the guiding. Probably, stop here. yeah. She she she's the organizer. So I mean, did you did you speak Spanish? Un poco, uh, very little, and uh, not only that, I didn't have a cell phone with me. Um, didn't I had have a, a cell phone. No, I didn't have a cell. I was given Shock a horror. Phone. I know. Just how did I live? How did I breathe? I had a very poor cell phone. By that, I mean it was given to me by a cell phone company about a year ago. And I thought, great, this is a cell phone. But it doesn't work very well. There's no memory in it. So I can't load any apps on it except for one that my wife put on called Line. And we were able to talk to each other for free on that. But I never okay. bought a cell phone chip in Spain, so I couldn't make phone calls. Um, I don't know cell phones very well. Anyway, the, and the camera could only take maybe one photo before the memory was overloaded. So it was useless. And um, I wound up having to ask the baristas if they would please call for me for different services. And I would just wind up giving them a euro or two. And everyone seemed very happy. So I say all that because I didn't speak Spanish. But I don't know if it would have mattered because... Um, if I needed a service, it seemed easier just to ask the person at the bar if they could help me, and they would make a phone call in perfect Spanish. Cool. I mean, so if you didn't have a cell phone, most people using their mobile phones doing the, on the app, the Bon Camino app. So you didn't do that then. So was you having an, like an old-fashioned guidebook? Yeah. I shouldn't say old-fashioned. That's not. Interview, I pulled it out, with I, which I thoroughly recommend. Ah, okay. That's a different one. It's not the John Briley one. No, oh, no, I had the Briley and looked at it. This one, I think, is, well, quite good. So is I that written by Johnny Walker? It is written by Anna Dintaman and David Landis. Okay. So does that give information of albergas and stuff like that? Yeah. See it. it is perfect. It gives information on everything. So right. there it is listed for our viewers. Um and Alberger's listed here, and in town information here. Um, I thought it was very well organized and um, makes for a very good read as well. Okay, so you can learn about where you're going as well as everything yeah. else. 
Okay. Yeah. Right, I'm going to ask you the quick fire round questions now. Are you ready? I'm just going to start at the no. top. Okay, right. Let's talk gear. Do you recall the weight that you carried in your pack? Yes, I did. Oh, do I recall? I thought you said did I recall? <laughs> uh, I recall the weight. It was 16 pounds. 16 pounds? Now, that's not including water, though. I did carry a lot of water with me. So that was just my gear. Okay, so that's another question then. So water, are you a bottle person or are you a hydration pack person? I carried a um, Nagaline bottle, which I would just fill from the taps, uh, even from the restrooms, even after someone had just exited the restroom, uh, male or female, I would turn the tap water on bravely and I never once got sick. So that's another thing is like some people say, oh, you should always filter your water. But actually, I don't think I didn't see anybody doing that. Apart from one couple that were camping, they were filtering their water. Do you remember the guy that had the wheelbarrow? Yes, I, I, <laughs> I do. Yes. And they had yeah. loads. They had loads of gadgets and stuff like that. And one of his luxury items was a water filter. I guess if a person were camping next to a stream and filtering water would be a very good idea, but the water from the tap all seemed uh, potable and, and sterile and fine. And at the town fountains, they had areas where they would indicate that it's drinkable and other parts of the fountain where it was very clearly not drinkable. So stick. Yeah, the signage was sign good, wasn't it? Very good, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's clear. So no, I don't think there's any need to purify the water. Okay. So uh, did you carry a sleeping bag or just a sleep sheet? I did carry a combination of the two. I carried a quilt. So it's for like a top sheet of a sleeping bag. And I did use that um, every time I stayed in Alberge. I did pull that out and needed it for warmth, even though everyone said you'll never need that. Well, we walked in May and June and July, and it got a little cool at night, so I was... Yeah, it did. Yeah. I think this is a record time of it being that cool. Oh. It's, un it's unusual. I think literally the week after we got back, it, this, the heat just suddenly rocketed, and it went into late 40s, but most of the time it was in the 20s. Oh, I'd recommend bringing one, and then if you don't use it, leave it behind. Some other cold pilgrim may be able to use it someday it wasn't very expensive i did also bring a sheet that was treated with anti um bed bug anti flea um, preventative um, spray and that i wound up giving away at an alberge oh like in week one just that i wasn't using it and didn't seem necessary and no i never got a single bed bug bite uh, but i didn't use it yeah. the sheets did you ever hear of anyone on the trail as well that did get bitten by bed bugs? Oh yeah, yeah, a couple of people. In fact, I one that you know, I am, should be better with the names. If only I had a booklet with people's photographs and their biographical information, that would be lovely. <laughs> uh, and she did all that, and I can't wait to get my copy. Um, I forgot her. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, from Canada. Um, oh, Emma. Emma, yes. you, Emma had horrific right. bites that were so severe she had to go to the hospital to see a doctor. She, did. she had allergic reactions. Um, I ran into another woman from Canada. I don't think you met her from Prince George. She had some bed bug bites. Um, seemed like I ran into a handful of other people that had a bite here or there. So. Right. I, I didn't see anybody on one of the trips. One of the girls did. Mm -hmm. um, and that she was in the same hostel, just happened to be on her bed than none of the others, huh. uh, which was a bit strange. So she woke up. The only thing I got bitten by was a spider. I got bitten by a spider um, on the fir very first trip. It made me quite poorly. Uh, apart from that, I haven't had any of the... We're, we're putting people off here, aren't we? Should we, should we change the subject <laughs> No, because bed bugs are discussed. Bed bugs, blisters, <laughs> uh, hangovers, those are all discussed. Um, I, now, if I could just ask you a question, did you check your beds for bed bugs before you uh, would use the beds? Did you ever? Yeah, it was part of my routine. Really? That was, okay. Yeah, did you not do that? I just flop my. I was so tired. I just would flop my 
uh, gear down and go take a shower and forget about it. So just wondered if you did a thorough check and if you discovered anything when you checked. No, I don't, I don't recall seeing anything, but yeah, we did. Some of them, most places were quite clean. I, I thought they were wonderful. They were fantastic. Yeah. In fact, we stayed because we started on the last one from Carrion de las Condes, mm-hmm. um, and like the first four days, they were brand new hostels. Whenever they just seemed to have popped up, uh-huh. so on the outskirts of town, and sometimes there was only like four or five pilgrims in these like big brand new, brand new hostels. Oh, it was great. That's wonderful. I stopped staying at the hostels um, about halfway through. I opted for private rooms, so those cost about oh, 10 to 15 euros more than the hostels. So um, I just made that decision because I felt like I wanted some privacy after a while. Well, so I think because there was me, Rachel, and Julie, so we would probably do the same. So there was we'd stay at a private room, but we a private room for three people. Oh, okay, right, right, right. And like with one bathroom for all three of us, rather than bunk bedrooms, you know that's fine doing that for the experience. But it's it's so nice having your own room and a decent night's sleep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can tell your viewers sometimes the bathrooms are one floor above or one floor below. Sometimes sharing a room with seven other people uh, on bunks just gets to be a bit tiring. But just try it. Different cultures. Different cults. The, the cults. Different expectations of privacy. Uh, and <laughs> how to The Europeans tell don't mind. They they don't mind the nakedness, do they? I didn't see any nudity, and I certainly never uh, pranced around nude. Um, I thought people were very discreet. What I noticed is, um, well, I'll just say at one time a guy came in and without even showering took off his shirt and hung it on the bed railing above me. Um, So a sweaty shirt laced with nicotine from a guy who'd been walking for eight hours wasn't the best way to begin my nighttime sleep pattern. So I think I'm a little old for this stuff. Uh, I think I want to get a private room. So I thoroughly recommend private rooms. Um, They're not expensive. They're not expensive. Help the local economy as well. Um, I also left a tip whenever I stayed in a private room. And one time, Are you just reminding me what you're, we were talking about trail names, wasn't oh, we? Oh, yeah, right. Do you remember? Because on all the big trails, you know, like the AT and the PCT, mm. everyone has a trail name. And it was like, I was keen to get that started on the Camino, but it hasn't quite happened. But well, the tra- can I tell everyone what yours was? There's so many people on the Camino, uh, the, on those other wilderness trails um the trail names are supposed to be about a person's personality uh so my trail name is big tipper because at the restaurants and if i stayed at a hotel i'd make sure to tip which was i guess was just shocking to many of the other people on those trails because you're usually trying to be as again what's the polite way to say this as frugal as possible <laughs> good word not tight <laughs> right also known as cheap <laughs> yeah um, so um the Camino is not expensive. To walk the Camino is not expensive at all. In fact, I was surprised at how inexpensive it was. People have to eat and sleep no matter what. But anyway, I left tip. And one time a um, housekeeper ran downstairs after me, thanking me profusely for what I thought was just, you know, a five or seven euro tip. Uh, she was happy about that. Unless she was mocking me. I had no idea. I don't think so. I can imagine that's probably one of the biggest tips they would had in a long time. So, so yeah, help the so, economy out, help a few people out. So, absolutely, and put a smile on someone's face. There you go. It's worth it. Is that what the Camino is all about? Smiles, not miles. Absolutely, <laughs> smiles, not miles. <laughs> I like that one as well. That should be your quote of the day. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, you said you, you you thought the Camino was like a, a spiritual journey, um, but if you was going to give advice to a brand new person who's probably thinking about, you know, should I should I walk the Camino? I've heard about this. I'm not sure if it's for me. Is there any like sound advice that you would actually give a newbie person? Go. You will have a wonderful time. Uh, the door is open to all. I'm sorry. The the way is open to all. I can't imagine having a bad time on the Camino, and if a person did, 
they do have things called buses and trains and one can leave and then just yeah. go off to Las Vegas for the weekend instead, if that's what your preference is. I think it <laughs> much goes a wonderful experience. I never heard anybody on the Camino say, this is terrible. Uh, I heard people um, soar with blisters or shin splints who were leaving a bit yeah. early, but not because they didn't like the experience. It was just became physically hard or they had other commitments to go to, which is understandable. Those who were. Did you have any? Uh, did you have any ailments? I did. Or? I had shin splints for four days. Um, it was all of a sudden. It, it hurt like the Dickens. It was terrible. Uh, but I iced my leg and rested, and it got the shin splints went away. So did you wear like a? I got shin splints as well, oh. um, but it's hard to rest up if you know that you've got a flight booked. Obviously, you had seven weeks, so it was probably quite good that you had that time to rest. Mm. Um, but I kept my leg elevated for like a whole evening and didn't move. And then I bought a compression, that was in Leon, and I bought a compression sock just on one leg, so I did look a bit weird. Um, and that seemed to do the trick, but yet yeah, mm. you've never felt pain like it. Every time you put your foot down, it was like your the front of your leg was on fire. Yep. Yeah, I thought yeah, I torn not... a muscle. Uh, it was horrible. I haven't heard about compression socks. That's a great idea. Uh, all a person can really yeah. do is rest until a person heals enough. I looked it up on what a person should do for shin splints, and it was not walk, which yeah. <laughs> doesn't help. <laughs> very when you. <laughs> On the Camino, that doesn't help at all, does it? Well, back to the bar, then. I, oh, I can't walk to the bar. I guess I'll crawl. So, <laughs> so what? What did you think to the wine? Uh, you know, the wine was pretty good. Um, that's a great question. I like wine a lot. I do drink wine, and I thought the wine was good. But I, let's see, where was I? I was in Burgos and um, went to the tourist office, and a gentleman there had lived in California in Lake Tahoe and had studied the wines and he was fluent in English and he sat me down and gave me a whole wine lesson about Spanish wine. <laughs> I'm fascinating. And his the main message was when you can try to get the Gran Reserva. Uh, or if you can't do that, order Reserva. And he was exactly right. For another Euro uh, one could get a glass of Reserva at some places, not all and I thought there was a dramatic difference in the taste of the wine between the um, standard Rioja and then the Reserva, which I found far more flavorful and tasty and a much better body. Did you have a, an area of the Camino that you, you liked more, like the Pyrenees was, or oh. the Meseta or you know, which, which area? You know, they all had their beauty. Um, I don't know. You know, the Pyrenees are beautiful. But storms came in, and it rained like crazy on the second day coming down the Pyrenees. Well, I'm sorry, the third day leaving the Pyrenees, and the trail was just a river. The Meseta, everyone uh, seemed concerned about the heat. I didn't think the heat was bad at all. Um, of course, in the late afternoon, yes, it was very hot, but um, nothing tragic. And in the end, there's a lot of anticipation at the end, so it's all good. Um, yeah. I had heard that uh, the, some sections were more industrial, and that is true. There are some sections that are more industrial. Going into the cities can be a bit um, discouraging with the industry and sometimes bewildering because I often got lost going into the city and out of the city. Okay, as in lost the arrows. And... Yeah, lost the arrows. And, and that's when I was really jealous of people who had cell phones that could say, oh, I'm, I'm right here, I need to go over there. I didn't have that. Uh, I asked um, police officers to help me out, and they did. I asked locals to help me out. They were very accommodating, and it was I think on one of our trips, um, I got poorly, and we ended up getting a bus. Me and Rachel got a bus into Le Grognol, and, and then we had no idea from the bus station how to get to the alberga. So um, I didn't understand this woman at all, and in the end... This little old lady, um, she just grabbed my arm and walked us across the city. Oh! Like so she was like, and she waffled away in Spanish. I have no idea what she was saying, <laughs> and we were just following her. But at the end of the day, she just took us right there. Was, she was obviously frustrated that we didn't understand, and in the end, it's like 
follow me. And uh, I just think the Spanish people love pilgrims. Yeah. It's not like an inconvenience to them at all. They they embrace it everywhere you go. It's like bon camino, bon, and they must get. You'd have thought they got fed up of it, but it's not at all. I suppose the it's it keeps their country alive. I suppose for that for certain villages anyway. Sure, everything you say is, seems so uh, accurate and reminds me of other experiences. But yes, I think the people are very accommodating. You know, they've seen pilgrims come through for a couple of hundred years now, so they're they're fairly used to seeing. <laughs> people with backpacks looking lost uh, and I think it does a lot for their economy and their national image so justifiably so um, so you know getting back to your original question does a person need to speak Spanish or I guess your question was did I speak Spanish not a bit it certainly is nice a uh, few, uh, few key phrases certainly go a long way like Muchas gracias and um, lo siento. Café con leche. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but sign language can also work. These days, of course, there's the phones with the apps where you can just mumble your expression in whatever language and instantly translate it into an uh, audio form of Spanish. So it's not necessary, but it it helps. Yeah, I think they appreciate it if you make the effort. Yeah, if you make so the effort. I used an app for uh, nearly a year to learn a little bit of Spanish called Duolingo. Uh -huh. And uh, so you just do a little bit every single day. Uh -huh. So I, I had I had a, a, I could get by in Spanish. But then, you know, most of the time, it was on one of the occasions I was walking with a guy called Eric from Holland. Uh -huh. He spoke fluent Spanish. Then I was walking with Sue uh -huh. and Anna, and they both spoke fluent Spanish, which was just brilliant. So you, you get a bit lazy and you just ask other people to order for you, which is not necessarily a good thing to do. But well, I don't know. I mean, that is nice just to have a friend who can do all the uh, questions and answers in Spanish. That is convenient, though. Um, that is true. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you two more questions, okay? So the first question I'm going to ask you is luxury items, because I've got to ask everybody that. Absolutely. So what was your, what was your, your luxury item? Yeah, um, much to other people's merriment and amusement, I did bring a battery-operated toothbrush. Uh, my dental hygienist had recommended it. Not necessary at all. And I thought about leaving it behind several times because it was noisy and, well, just kind of dorky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> surprisingly held on to it and when I got home my other actual electrical um, Sonicare toothbrush had broken so I thought well here's a lesson from the Camino I've got it right here and I can order the other super duper one um, so that's what I carried and eh. okay. <laughs> some shame and my, <laughs> my last question is um, people often say that the Camino or the true Camino starts when you get home is that how you felt? No, I thought the Camino started when I started the Camino, but um, I guess the point being that that's a chance to reflect when you get home. Um, did anything change for you when you got home? Yeah. Or was, did you feel, was it more of a holiday? No, I thought, um, I walked alone most days. I was alone a lot, and um, I'd prefer to have been with a family. So as I mentioned to you, I was very grateful to meet you and then to walk with people who are a group and become part of a family. Uh, no, for me, the Camino started the first day and the excitement actually started driving to the airport and the excitement and wondering what might happen, good or bad. Um, that was all thrilling and a bit of frustration at the beginning as well. I think your point about the Camino starting when one gets home that's true, too, because um, I think then you can take the lessons of the Camino with you, not to take things too seriously, not to get too discouraged, um, and to appreciate what we have. Um, you know, I'm a teacher, and this semester has been the best by far, and when I met other teachers at our professional development day, they all looked pretty, well, sad, frustrated that school was starting again, discouraged that they had to teach people again, just terrible. And um, I thought it was great to see these people again. I didn't teach summer school, and I was very excited to say hello. And I think I see that also in the students that I teach now. They seem much more at ease, and we're joking a lot more in the class than we ever did. 
And so I think the Camino has wonderful, valuable lessons of being grateful and being kind and um, listening. So all those lessons, uh, I suppose, have held from the Camino and I'm still learning them. I, I think if there's one thing you do need on the Camino, it's something that you, uh, you have lots of, uh, and that's a sense of humor. <laughs> it helps. You know, it's a, it does help to have a sense of humor because there are humorous things that happen on the Camino and if you can't laugh at yourself then you've got a bit of a problem. We, do, we did meet a few people that, that perhaps struggled with that and perhaps that was one of the lessons that they needed to learn uh, throughout, throughout their Camino. But I must admit the day that I walked with you I haven't laughed that much in such a long time because you've got a very dry sense of humor and you just, you don't even realize, you don't say it with humor, it just comes out. Well, I was going to say, you too are quite a breath of fresh air to meet you and to talk and to laugh and to share jokes and experiences. So you're quite delightful to talk with as well. Um, I was very grateful. I never met a bad person on the Camino. Um, we met a person whose name will go unmentioned who seemed unhappy. And I was going to add that ironically, when I last saw him in Santiago, he seemed much more at ease. He seemed to be kind of taking things with a shrug, which I thought was revealing. Yeah, uh, step forward, so. Yeah, yeah. perhaps so. That was um, a good sign. Yeah, absolutely. But I never met a person where I thought I can't wait to get away from this person or see this person is evil incarnate. Uh, no, everyone was pretty good natured, uh, good group. Um, Just uh, say. Yeah. There are some people, though, that you work with who you just think, you know, I, I just, like some people are there sometimes, I felt, just to offload. And I did meet a couple of people that, in the end, I ended up walking a bit slower or saying, oh, I've just got to go to the loo in a cafe. I'll catch you up. And then I probably wouldn't see them again. But mm -hmm. you can you can deal with it that way, you know. If, I don't know, perhaps I just wasn't in the place to actually have that offloaded to me at that time maybe that's hmm. what it was i don't know by offloaded do you mean they were sharing too much of their burdens with you yeah do you know there's one guy i, I literally I'd, i hadn't even met him we literally it was just you know when you're just walking and you're going to overtake and you say bon camino and yeah. then he started talking and then literally for a, about 40 minutes i had his life story you know divorce problems and i didn't hmm. do any talking and I just sat. I just sat and listened, which was fine. But I didn't. I didn't even know this guy to even offer advice in a way. You know, I think he just needed to talk, and I just needed to listen. But I didn't want my whole day being like that. So that's right. when I said, All right, "I'll see you later." Yeah, interesting. No, I never had that happen. I found everyone kind of approached their life story somewhat gingerly, um, which was fine by me. I didn't think it was meant to be a walking confessional. Uh, <laughs> well, perhaps, guess, perhaps it's because I was a lady, maybe. Perhaps you found you a welcoming uh, person to listen to a story. I don't know. I hadn't heard that, but that's an interesting point. People do share um, a lot of personal information, which is fine. So, yeah. As long as you're comfortable sharing that. Well, perhaps, perhaps, he, perhaps it was just timing, you know, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it could cool. be. Anyway. Well, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure, shoot. Were you ever lonely on the Camino? No. Okay. I don't think so. No, not at all. I didn't feel lonely. If anything, I because I have a really, I, you know, I work in social media, so my, just, my job is just on the go constantly. I just reveled. That was probably why I had a bit of an issue with this guy. I just needed to be on my own. Mm -hmm. And I was looking forward to having time on my own where I'm not really talking to anybody because I talk to people all day, every day. So I, I, I loved being on my own. I never felt lonely. You well, felt, did, do you feel like that then? I, I did overhear your conversation, which is why I ended up, not why I ended up talking to you, but I, I remember you saying about your Camino family and you, was, you hadn't quite found your family. Yeah, I so, did. As I thought, I thought it was somewhat frustrating. I met great people the um, second night, which was in Orison, and um, met interesting people. And I thought, oh, this, you know, let's see how we all handle this path, and 
We're going to walk together for maybe five or six weeks. It should be intriguing. Never saw them again. So I always wondered, whatever happened to them? Where Did they make it? Did they decide to move to Barcelona and teach English? What happened to these characters? So I'm always curious, uh, but never heard if they made it or not. And I found that to be lonely because I kept meeting great people, intriguing people, fun people. And then we'd walk different uh, paces the next day. I would never see them again. So I found that to be somewhat uh, discouraging, not yeah. terrible. As I would walk the next day, I'm just starting all over again every day, meeting new people. And I thought it'd be kind of nice just to have a group to sort of, sort of walk with. Not that I would recreate the movie The Way by any means, but just that I would um, meet some fellow friends. That didn't happen until, like I said, the very end, I met you and Rachel and Sue, and that was all quite delightful. I should share that with you. Cool. <laughs> right, I'm going to say goodbye. Apart from, we're going to say goodbye and leave you with a quote. Norman has prepared a quote. Dum, da, dum, dum, dum. Life begins when you leave your comfort zone. Ooh. And what was your comfort zone? Uh, well, my electric toothbrush, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I found out on the back of a fortune cookie. Um, let me think. Uh, when did I leave my comfort zone? Well, probably when I got shin splints was about the most miserable uh, I've been in a while. And uh, getting over the shin splints, life felt much, much better after that. So, cool. How about for you? Um, I think actually going on my own, because I've never done anything on my own before. So yeah. that first that first moment of actually getting on that plane, I travel on my own all over the UK for business, but mm -hmm. with a backpack, not knowing I've got anywhere booked, that was really pushing myself out of my comfort zone. But oh, okay. be best thing I've ever done. So I love it. And I'm That's going back again. And you're doing the AT, a little bit of the yes. AT? I'll be on the Appalachian Trail, uh, leaving in May, flying into Atlanta, and then getting a shuttle up to where I stop, which is about, not very far, about 70 miles up the trail, and continuing on for a longer journey for about three, maybe four weeks on the Appalachian Trail, and hope to hike through Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So we shall see. Maybe I'll make it out of the parking lot, maybe not, just see how it goes. Well, we'll definitely keep in touch, and I want to see some photos. That sounds good, Julia. But I'm sure we'll, sounds... talk, we'll talk before then. Okay, can I ask you a final question? Oh, go on then. <laughs> any recommendations? Uh, I'll ask you, any recommendations for someone who's thinking of doing the Camino? And in particular, what number one piece of gear should a person have besides a backpack or shoes? And a mini printer. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, do you know, there's one luxury item that I took that I would take with me every single time that I go on the Camino and that's my trekking umbrella, mainly because of the, the sun, um, you know, especially the setter when it did get hot, putting that umbrella up when there was no trees around was just <laughs> yeah, heaven. So I would say get yourself a trekking umbrella. There's a brand well, called Eurosherm. Euro. You didn't find that a hat was adequate then, an umbrella really was necessary in the well, Meseta? I'm the, the umbrella was great. I, uh, I did wear a hat as well, but no, because your head still gets hot. Okay. Uh, whereas the trekking umbrella, because it's got the reflective bit on, reflects the sun. Yeah. But I also have this other gadget, which was, you know, my buff. Yes. Okay, cause it's called a mission control cooling buff. So mm -hmm. basically you put it in water and then you snap it. So you know, like those hand warmers, and it oh. goes cold. So then you put it on, it's it's really cold, and then within two hours or so, it starts to warm up again. And you just re-snap it, and it goes cold again. How nice. cool is that? That is very cool, extremely cool, especially on the neck. Uh, now you actually have reminded me one key Spanish word I think everyone should know, besides gracias and lo siento, is the word for ice. So when you roll up to the bar and you want something with ice, since it's not normally given, learn the word yellow for ice. Yellow so, ice. Well, <laughs> I, was al I was always taught not to eat yellow ice. <laughs> that's funny. I've been doing that for years. Uh, you can say, for example, uh, cafe con yellow or Coca-Cola con yellow, por favor. So ah. I want a Coke with ice. Makes all the difference in the world, I found. 
So. Brilliant. Oh, I didn't know that. And I'll be using that in three weeks' time when I'm off to the Camino Inglés. Thank you for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And buon Camino. Buon Camino. Take care, mate. See you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.